in three, two, one. John, are we live? We're live, sir. What's going on, buddy? Not too much, my man. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with shout outs. I think I might one up you today, buddy. Yeah, I think you got it. I think I got you. Well, no surprise. For those of you who do follow me on Facebook and Instagram, you guys have probably seen the news. Um, lost Maverick uh, late Sunday night, Monday morning. I'll be brief about the story. Um, came home on Sunday and uh, was only gone for a few hours. And he was, uh, when I left, uh, just being himself, running around, being a uh, like a two-year-old, ten-year-old puppy. Um, and um, he was acting strange. He just didn't come to the door, which was weird for uh, for him. He did never not come to the door in ten years. And his ears were pinned back. My sister's a veterinarian, so uh, FaceTimed her. I said, Sheena, you know, what, what do you think? What should I do? He just kind of looks like he ate something bad. And uh, took him to uh, the emergency room just because I didn't want to take a chance. Thought um, he probably ate something bad. Found out he, uh, he had a tumor on top of his heart that had ruptured. And um, the doctors over there, uh, the ER doctor said, we'll... Um, We'll drain the fluid, and uh, he should have a couple days to a couple months, and that was a shock in and of itself. So I said, you know, please do whatever you can to just make him comfortable for a couple months, whatever it takes. And by the time I got home, which was about 10 minutes away, they called and uh, said he was not going to make it because the fluid was back. So I rushed back, uh, put him down, and uh, that was kind of it. It was uh, easily the uh, the worst night of my life, and um, definitely uh, just kind of came out of nowhere the day before he was just running around having uh uh the time of his life i was i was smoking uh meat for father's day so he was just uh going crazy because i had two smokers going and uh just wouldn't leave my side because i had all the meat and uh just uh life changed kind of like that for me so uh my shout out is obviously to uh maverick he my best friend um there felt like a part of me was gone uh, when he was gone that night, and uh, it uh, definitely feels very strange for me uh, without him. Uh, my other shout outs to everybody who um, called, text, uh, stopped by, people dropped off food. I mean, I just, I, I hope I was able to respond back to everybody that responded to me. I'm sure I missed some of you guys. Um, the amount of love that I got uh, for me, for Maverick, people who hadn't met him saying, you know, your posts about you and Maverick. Um, uh, we used to watch him. We felt like we knew him. Uh, we cried. We had never met him before. Um, just the amount of love I got from people was was unbelievable. So mm -hmm. um, shout out goes to those people. And then obviously Maverick for, you know, his best sure. 10 years of my life. And I do my very best to be the uh, the guy that I'm sure he saw me as. So it's very my good. shout out. And uh Again, thank you to everybody. It, it was very heartfelt, and uh, yeah, thank okay. you. Yep. Uh, on that note, of course, my, I know just from us being friends and seeing all the pictures and videos and silliness, uh, you know, he was a very happy dog, and you could tell that you two were buddies, and you'd go out and play and goof. And actually, I saw the pictures uh of you smoking all the meat and him sitting like in the background and i was like damn man i, I gotta get an invite over there <laughs> <laughs> it looked like what you were doing it looked great um so you know our hearts collectively uh broke for you because it was just it was it was so out of the blue and you know anybody that knows you knows <laughs> you like you said he was a part of you and so our condolences uh, i guess that would be I, I re tried to reflect as much as I could the last couple of days. And, uh, you know, if you have a dog and you, people who have dogs kind of get this, you, there's an unconditional love a dog has for you that mm -hmm. is just unmatched. You mm -hmm. know, whether it's friends, family, your dog just loves you mm -hmm. at, a, at a level that's just unjudging. Um, and I'll share an article uh, in the comment section after this that somebody sent me and uh, was a six-year-old's viewpoint on a dog passing away. And it was, it was brilliant about, you know, how a dog, views life sure. um and i was just thinking of you know why are dogs lives so short and it's just you know and people who don't have dogs and have kids will probably think i'm crazy but you love a dog like you would love a kid mm. and um you're not supposed to lose your kids before mm, right. yourself typically right. in life yeah. 
Um, and I think dogs, uh, they teach you how to love unconditionally, and they also teach you how to deal with loss, which is what I'm processing now, obviously. Sure. Um, so it's, uh, if anything, anything's a life lesson. And, uh, right. you know, he left me with a, with a pretty big one. Well, so again, condolences and, uh, you know, I saw uh, how many people reached out to you and in a weird way, small way, it had to make you feel a little bit better yeah. to know how much you mean and in part uh, Maverick does as well. So, yeah. Um, Thinking of all the good memories. There's yeah, a lot of fu- sure. funny ones. I went through oh, yeah. every every photo that I had on my phone. I was just kind of going through it and all sure. the goofy, fun memories. and. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I was very, very lucky to have them. You post a lot, but I can only imagine. You must have. I have thousands. Thousands. Right. Yeah, right I have right. thousands of them. <laughs> yeah. Some really goofy ones from when he was a puppy till now. So. So. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Shout out on my side of the coin. Completely different. <laughs> um, I want to give a shout out, as I do oftentimes, uh, to first responders and law enforcement the Port Authority in Philadelphia found in containers, shipping containers, um, 16.5 tons of cocaine. Whoa. Seized it. Party. It was a billion dollars worth of cocaine that just got seized at our port uh, in Philadelphia. Do they know where it came in from? Yeah, actually, it bounced around South America. Uh, wound up coming up to Philly and it was actually headed to Asia. It was it wasn't even bound for here from what they could tell. Um uh, but it was it was bound for Asia and it was sitting for however long. And I don't know how they do it and I'm not even gonna pretend, but just a shout out because whether it's here or Asia or wherever, the amount of uh after it got cut up and distributed, whatever, uh the the amount of kids that that would have affected poorly. Uh, that that saved a lot of lives. So yeah. I just want to give a shout out to Port Authority. I always do for cops and ICE and all of that. That they've got a lot of people poo pooing them, but uh, they do a good job. They try their best, and they got a big one this time. So, yeah, awesome. Yep, shout out. Uh, that's all I got. On cool. That. I'm excited for today's show. I didn't know until I walked into the studio that the two lovely ladies here know one another. Um, and their backstory is incredible. I'm going to get into Kelly Johnson first. She's the principal and founder of the Ballast Group. I'm not going to butcher what the Ballast Group does. I always tell everybody I'd rather you tell us what you guys do. Thank you for coming on and tell us what the Ballast Group does. Yeah, thank you. Well, to start, I want to dedicate this podcast to Maverick. Oh, thank you. I am an incredible dog lover. My dog, Junie, a Persian term uh, for darling. Yeah. She's 10 and a half too, and she teaches me a lesson every day. So we can't thank enough for our, our creatures in the world here, especially yeah. the dog creatures. What kind of dog is Junie? She's an Australian Labradoodle. Oh, adorable. Yes. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, they're so, great. Yes, and she's part of the Ballast Group because we are a, a cloud-based public relations firm. We focus mostly on medical and technology uh, clients, but we have a gamut of, of uh, different types of clients. So Junie sits next to me on feed almost every day. So she's awesome. been involved in almost every decision that the Ballast Group has ever made. <laughs> so a goon and bad. Uh, we, like I said, we're an integrated communication strategies firm. So we tell stories and we tell them in many different ways. And um, it's been my passion since I was a kid. I, I remember vividly winning a fifth grade creative writing contest. And at the award ceremony, my mother snapped the picture, and of course, that image you have in your head for decades, right? So I thought, hmm, maybe I could be good at storytelling. And then in college, I did an internship. Um, it was a liberal arts college that, you know, they don't have a PR major. They have an English major with communications, but you're studying Shakespeare and learning how to solve problems and think critically and globally. And so um, here at DePaul, where I teach, you know, the students are very lucky there's a dedicated PR program, but we kind of had to wing it. So I did my first internship at Universal Studios in Florida as the park was being built. And I had an English professor that kind of made that happen. And so those were two turning points that made me say, yeah, storytelling is my my wheelhouse. Fantastic. So integrated communication strategies to most people might seem complicated. It Basing it down, it's really kind of telling the story of the company, correct? Yes, uh, the organization, or it could be a person or a product or a service or a solution. And it's our job to find out how they're different and why people are gonna care about that. So I'm a twin. 
genetically identical. And growing up, you know, everyone said, Jolie, Kelly, the same thing. And we said, no, actually, we're not the same thing. We have different heads, different hearts, and we operate in the world a little bit differently, but we might look exactly alike. So I feel like I translated that experience with my clients as I started, and organizations that I'd worked for too, but then clients through Ballast Group, is we're always looking for how someone's different and unique and um, what that story is. And that's so important. I think a lot of companies fail to be able to give their both their story and their value proposition to the public or whoever they're trying to pitch to clearly. And I always, I would say use some childlike clarity, but effectively tell your story. And I feel like a lot of business owners are very good at maybe running a business, but they don't have that ability to tell a story. Right. And, and, and we do. always say too, the message is only as good as the medium. So where are you telling it and who are you telling it to? So um, you can target ads today to the right sure. kind of people or you can um, and be more strategic about it but today sort of uh, telling a story is um, a lot of content it's not just earned media and getting in the Wall Street Journal or Cranes or Barron's it's telling the story in multiple different channels so to guide your clients on what are the best channels for them takes a lot of skill I did a little looking into what you guys do so you, you brought up the idea of earned media but you do paid media shared media owned media as a business owner myself, I never thought of media as, you know, almost four different platforms like that. I just thought, you know, I pay for stuff on Facebook, I pay for some stuff that now goes to Instagram, and of course people share some stuff, but I never in my mind thought of it as you have to hit all four. It, it's become that way. So when I first started Ballast Group, I'm a, I always like to say a pure t traditional PR person. So it's working with reporters or editors or producers to tell your story. and. Over the dec last decade, it's become where you have to use those other channels. So not only earn, but paid, shared, and own, and integrate them. And then you're hitting almost every avenue you can to make your audience work for you. So you want to hit all of it, is what you yes. tell people. Yes, yes. And depending on budgets, clients sure. might say, start here, and then let's add as we go along. And you guys have, if you take a look at their website, the website has some of the largest companies out there smaller companies can come to you guys as well correct we love entrepreneurs okay great. I when I became one I mean I, that's my passion actually sure. um, it was a fluke how I became an entrepreneur it was a, a bad uh, career mulligan well tell us <laughs> so it's sort of a design and default a little bit but I I moved here to work for a multinational company uh, across the country and the job that I interviewed was not the job that was there. And I was miserable like a zombie walking into work every day after commuting almost an hour and a half to get there one way. So um, I started asking and questioning my values and my purpose. And I said, I actually put a sticky on the computer that said, do not take on their dysfunctions. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you put as much in, into life that we do in our careers, you want it to be fun and you want to add value and you want to have a set of values that drive you. And I didn't have that there. So I said, what do I want to do next? And I had never activated my network and started calling a couple of people. In fact, a dear friend that I worked with at Tropicana years ago in Florida, he now, uh, at the time, he was running Safeway in their marketing department. And he made one phone call and said, hey, we got a consulting gig for you. Would you like it? And I said, absolutely. So I realized after six months that I was working for myself. And I thought, I like this. Let's take it further. And I never looked back. Um, I have found incredible talent and team members of Ballast Group, as well as subject matter experts I can bring into our projects, because I mentioned earlier we're cloud-based. So we staff up, we can expand or deflate given marketplace conditions, but these subject matter experts I can pull in on projects that I have no idea about oil and gas or right. financial services. And we now have the ability to help clients in those spaces because I can take subject matter experts to become a part of our team. Yeah, you can add kind of let the chef do the cooking in really different wider range of areas and yes. expertises. Yeah, it's kind of what college taught me too. I mean, having a liberal arts background, it's um, you're curious all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that, that's one of our company values is curiosity. In our field, especially PR and creatives, you if you're not curious, you'll die mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest mistakes of uh, entrepreneurs and small business owners when they're first starting is not working with a team like you guys or having a real um, set forth plan of what you want to do with your, so whether it's social media, your shared media, paid media, earned media, I didn't know all these things. I'm actually after this probably going to go and take a look at all of it and learn or reach out to you guys. But um, just having an idea of telling your story. I think people are so busy just 
getting you know the doors open and getting everything running and maybe buying computers and just doing everything they can. A lot of entrepreneurs, especially uh, small ones, are doing a million tasks themselves that they're probably not good at. So do you do you see that people tend to come to you when they're now lost or do you see that a lot of people are coming to you up front when they first start off? It's, it's a blend, but mostly they're launching something. They have okay. something new to tell the world and they don't know how to tell it. Or they're a brand new startup with four employees and no revenues, but they have an incredible solution to a problem and they want a, the world to know about it. We help put one company on the map overnight. Um, in the media world, especially the earned media world, if an NBC affiliate picks up a story here in Chicago, any NBC affiliate in the country can pick it up. And a lot of them do because if the why is known, right, the um, why people are going to care about your story, then why would they send a whole new crew out to cover that story in their market when it's already been packaged really nicely to be picked up in their own market? So they were on the map overnight and orders started coming in from 32 different states. It was really magical. Like when those moments happen in, in um my world it's exciting yeah i'm a geek oh, <laughs> I'm i think excited we, about that. collectively all four of us in here might be um and you you said you teach at depaul as well so it's I really am. a passion piece for you because you're yes. teaching very early on students yes what you do yeah at ballast. I, I i started out as a adjunct professor and it was about 15 hours a week so it's a it's a commitment yeah that's right? a real for commitment. one class 30 students and i love it I don't always teach. And then I morphed it into guest lecturing, and now I mentor at the Coleman Entrepreneur Center at DePaul, too. So I like seeing people's light bulbs go off, and I like yeah. seeing when they they're, they have a passion about something, and I like to help foster that. Awesome. And how does somebody reach out to you? What's the best way for somebody to get a hold of you guys? Uh, website, ballastgroup.com. Ballast, okay. by the way, is a sailing term. Uh, it's Tell a, us about it. I, a, I know what it is. But. <laughs> it's an engineering term, essentially, but I... Um, Ballast is the weight of a ship that helps keep it moving forward and steady in the right direction. Okay. It could be people, it could be a keel or lead in the boat. But I use that as a metaphor for our clients that we help keep them steady and moving in the right direction, if not exceeding where they want to go. So, uh, and there's a lot of good nautical references in our world. In free time, you love to sail, is my guess? Tonight. Tonight I'm You're racing. going tonight? Season started, but it's Whoa. freezing and the fog is setting into our lovely June Chicago. <laughs> so what is a, I race cars, not boats, uh, so I'm very big into racing things. Um, and our next guest is into racing bicycles. Yes. Well, you're into them too. <laughs> um, how does racing boats work? Oh, it's exciting. Sailing to me is probably one of the best teamwork sports yeah. ever. And I played volleyball in college. Okay. And I, you have a role on the boat okay. that you do, and everyone knows what they do. But then when the wind comes up, and I'm two feet away from you, and I, you can't hear me because the wind, are, wind is carrying my words behind me. Um, everybody watches out for one another. So you're helping and you're watching and safety first, right? There's some accidents that have happened, especially in the Mackinac race, the big race here that is every July. Um, you just always have to be aware of your surroundings. And it's just fun. I mean, I love when the engine shut off. I don't like engines. I don't like the smoke. I don't like the fumes. Yeah. Um, but when the wind is powering you and it's mother nature and you never know what you're going to get, it sort of, again, makes you curious uh, the entire time you're on the water. Well, it's problem solving and teamwork, like you said. Always. And so, like tonight, what are you guys going to do? So tonight, it's early in the season. There may not be that many boats out. Admittedly, it's my first time. I've been traveling quite a bit, so I've missed okay. a couple races. There's a race committee boat, and then all the boats start leaving the harbor, and they go out about, um, I'm not sure, about 25 minutes offshore, and there's a course set up. And you check your watches, and the gun you know the gun goes off at a certain time, so you have to get into the race sequence and um, make sure you don't go over the line early and don't knock someone out. There's lots of rights away on the water uh, and rules. So... Um, once that race starts, it's kind of like everybody can see where they need to be, but people take different tactics, sort of a metaphor for life. Sure. I know where I need to be, but I might start out going left or might start out going right. Um, and then you shift. If, if you're not the lead boat, you're watching the lead boat. <laughs> you yeah. say, what's he doing differently that I'm not doing? So it's fun. And then, of course, once you go through the finish line, all the, everyone starts popping the celebrations, the libations, Fantastic. and we talk about the night. So when do, does is it start when the sun goes down? Uh, before the sun goes down. Before the sun goes so, down. And that's and why you have a hard set. You got to get out of I here. Do. Oh, that's you're going racing. <laughs> going I racing. love that. Um, how long have you been doing that? I'm fascinated by I've the been racing. Sailing for 20 years, but okay. I, I didn't learn till later in life. Most people yeah. learn at the 
the, you know, the knee of their dad or mom on the boat. Um, and I started when I was 32 in Sarasota, Florida, which is a near and dear place to me. Um, and I just graduated from there. I started on lasers, small boats, and then lightnings. And they have spinnakers, you know, the big colorful chute that goes out in front of the boat. And so when you're going, the wind's coming from behind you, it's pushing you forward. Okay. It's really spectacular on, a, especially in San Francisco Bay, where you just were, um, to watch boats with 20 different boats with colorful spinnakers out. It's a, a beautiful sight to see. The day before our triathlon, we were doing a practice swim. And actually, there was a lot of sailboats that had went out in the bay and they actually cut our practice swim short because we were right away they were both we were just swimmers in the water and they pulled yeah they pulled us in because said and there were so many of them and they couldn't see us we were Mm -hmm. just heads bobbing up and down in the water. So right. they, they pulled us out and they took us to a different place to practice a little bit. But uh, Somebody didn't coordinate schedules yeah. that day. <laughs> well, apparently coming out of whatever harbor they're at, they don't have to report out to the bay, uh, whoever it is that watches the bay. They can just come out of that harbor. So hmm. the people that had scheduled our swim said we would have had no idea that they were coming out. And they just pulled out and everybody's like get on they're yelling at us get on the boat oh, get on the boat crazy you know that's how a woman lost her leg here in, in the, um, the monroe harbor over no. the sea dog the yeah, motorboat yeah. accident but yeah. she was swimming um yeah at training for a triathlon and got ha- from her knee, her knee down from the um, sea dog they just didn't see her nobody knew you know as a swimmer you have to be really responsible right. you, it doesn't matter how hard your hard your arms come out of the water yeah they can't, see, can't you. see you wow i didn't know that well, I'm not going swimming in Monroe Harbor anywhere near the Sea Dog. No, no, let's avoid that. I think I'm going to stay at the Lifetime Pool. It was working out just fine for me until I jumped in the bay. That seems a little more calm, a little easier. For sure. Do you use fitness and these things as a way to just get away from work? And also, obviously, it's a metaphor for the racing's a metaphor for life and business. But is kind of fitness and everything what you like to do in your free time? I think no matter how hard we work and what we do in life, if we don't have our health, we don't have anything. And you know, I've had health scares before. We might talk about that a little bit, but I feel like um, people, especially entrepreneurs and executives, need to learn how to take care of themselves because if we can't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of our teams and our clients and our life. And um, I've established some pretty good practices, I think, for for eating and um, hydration and, and staying fit, you know, working out six days a week. I think it's just my outlet for clarity and to decompress and I usually do it in the mornings I don't know why just, yeah are you a morning I, person yeah up early five in the morning I, mean, I was born at five in the morning they say okay. whatever time of day you're born that's why you're either an early riser or not I was 3 15 p.m. that's why I'm a late riser <laughs> 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 makes a lot of sense now mm-hmm. and you're doing a 50 mile bike race with our next guest I am and she's going to give me some tips because I'm not a pro like she is but it's we have four months to train for it well, one of your favorite books is one of her favorite books. And I'm going to bring her on right now because I think we're going to have a great round table at the end of this. Um, and she's kind of the mentor into bike racing and for you. My, she was my life coach. For, Which is but awesome. Business coach, life coach, coach, Debra. Well, I'm going to bring Debra Sunderland on. She's the founder of the Sunderland Coaching uh, LLC group. She, um, I have had a lot of fun talking with her before we came on the show. I'm going to let you, just like um, Kelly did, tell us what Sunderland Coaching does, and then we'll just kind of get into Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. So it's interesting hearing everyone speak today. Um, What I do is for people to live an abundant life and for them to notice that it's not outside of themselves that's ever going to bring them joy. And I really um, lead the highest leaders that I could possibly meet here in Chicago or in the world and realize that they are still not getting the results they want and they're still looking outside themselves Uh, for security control approval and so my work is coaching them to understand their unconscious behaviors and statements to themselves that are getting them the results they don't want and so how are our results whatever you have in life when they're not for us maverick yeah dying uh, my near death kelly's near death how are those things to teach us from a deep deep core way sure and even anywhere and result in between in our life that if everything is for our learning there is no mistake sure so that's really where i play and so i have a group of um a team that believes and practices this for themselves and then their uh, work and then they coach under me and we coach teams leaders ceos executives around taking responsibility and what are they creating for themselves in their work instead of blaming themselves or someone else how do i take responsibility and learn from this and how do i raise up a culture that's about learning and growing together 
Well, that's so important. I, and, you know, I looked at, you know, things that you do, you, you talk a lot about culture, and I think culture in a business environment or, or a, your home environment, mm-hmm. any environment really is, is of the utmost importance. Um, and I, I love that you touched on you can learn, you have to learn from everything. You know, I, the last two days, um, that's what can I learn from this? What, mm. what can I take from this? What is, what can I learn from a losing Maverick and B, um, just my dog in general, my relationship with him and just how to cope with loss. So I think you, there's a learning piece in everything we do and everything that happens. Mm-hmm. You, um, touch on the 15 commitments of conscious leadership and mm-hmm. both of you said that was a book or, um, uh, something that you guys both utilize a lot. I've never looked into it. Mm-hmm. And now, especially because both of you are kind of uh, advocates of it, I'm going to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, um, it came about right after my accident. So six years ago, June one, um, I was in a national criterium race. I raced criterium bike racing and was unconscious, literally. And when I came up out of my coma, um, I was told that it was going to take myself, my body, three years, my brain specifically to heal. And unconsciously as a child I learned to tell myself what I was going to believe and um, create from that what I was wanting to to create for myself I grew up in a family that was not healthy and safe and um, I became very successful learning to stand for myself well when you are injured and in bed and can't get out of bed and walk and talk um, the only thing you really have is your brain but when your brain isn't functioning what do you do So I started to realize that the power of my choice, of my thinking, would recreate a new path for my life. And I realized, um, this is really my life change for me, is that as I was healing physically, there was internal healing to be had. Um, And in that process, um, I, I cried out and I just wondered, what is my purpose that my life is still here? because I had accolades for um, business support, um, starting companies, being successful, helping other leaders be successful, yet my life was more than getting things done or helping other people get their things done. So I was lying in bed after my accident um, at home. I was in a coma for a month and in the hospital for a month, and there I was told, as I'd said, three years to heal, four days of healing, uh, four days of um, PT, OT, and speech therapy for months. And I just thought, okay, so how is this for me? What can I learn from? And what is my purpose? And I was well enough to drive, at some point, my son to school. He was commuting by train to the city, and my daughter was in the back there four years apart, and I was dropping her off after I dropped him off at the train. And he, he we lived in a wealthy community, Hinsdale, so... Um, I, I say this for a reason. She sees him get off the train or onto the train and sees a bunch of people getting on the train to go to work. And she says, Mom, why does everyone look so unhappy getting on the train going to work? And I got really sad. And she's 12 telling me this. And it's not that these people have for want, right? Sure. And I said, You know, honey, you're right. Most of them are unhappy. Dropped her off. And I kept thinking about that, thinking about it. I went to get on my bike and train. In just the same place where these people were on the train, I was going over that same track with my bike, and it hit me. Thank God I almost died doing something I love doing, and I was great at it. Yeah. These dear precious people are probably great at what they do, but they don't have joy. And they're dying a slow death every day and don't even realize it. Sure. My calling is to ignite that, wake up for them, get out of the autopilot as to what is success, what is bringing you happiness and to support leaders who have the most really live an abundance from inside, not just outside. And in that process, I uh, started to seek out different coaching and where, how do people coach and, and what's the philosophy around it and how is that coaching going to support my growth to coach other people. And I came upon um, the 15 commitments of conscious leadership and I read just the introduction and I was like, this is it, just reading the introduction. So I reached out to Jim Dethmer, one of the founders of the Conscious Leadership, um, 15 Commitments Conscious Leadership Group, and I said, we have to meet, we have to meet. So he happened to live in Chicago and we met and I said, I 
practice this. I want to know this more. I want to bring this to the world. And so lo and behold, that was about four and a half years ago, five years ago, that I started implementing it into my life with my children, myself, and it's unfolded to um, the company now that I specifically coach out of. Well, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I agree with you on everything and specifically I, I see people all the time I actually I've noticed the sitting I, I drive a lot so I sit in traffic and I, I mm-hmm. you see people driving to work and you, it, it's you look out of your window you see a row of very upset looking people yeah. just kind of uh, in a monotonous rut just going to work yes. every single day yes. like you said it's a you're dying a very slow death. What do you think it is? Is it the culture? Is it just uh, monotony? What what causes that? Because most people don't get into a job or a profession that they know they're going to hate two years, yeah. three years, five years down the line. Yeah. What is it that over time just creates this, I, I hate what I'm doing? Yeah. So I think it starts when you go to school. Okay. Um, my belief is that when we are sent off to school, um, we are told what to do when sure. to do it, how it needs to look to get the grade that we want to get, to get to pass to second grade, third grade, graduate from school, to get to the college we want, to get to the company we want to work at. And what happens there, it's the same thing, right? Just as Kelly had shared, we think it's going to be a certain way and we're going to be happy doing it, but it, it never is. And we're constantly looking outside of ourselves for what is aligning with us and what success is. Someone's telling us. Sure. Right? And no one knows better than we do is what aligns with us. So it's getting back to ourselves. People have lost themselves. Mm -hmm. They've gone out here. And so how do we get back to our whole yes, our genius? So combining our joy with our excellence. So getting that back is what brings you mentioned whole yes, and we, we touched on it before we went live. What do you mean by that? Because I really love that idea of a whole yes, and mm-hmm. I think it mm-hmm. utilizing that every day will make people better at saying no to things that they should not yeah. be doing. Yeah, so um, we have something I didn't share. We have, I'm sure you've heard this, an amygdala, mm-hmm. right? Part sure. of our brain that is always scanning for what is right, what is good, how to be better, how to keep us safe. And we are reactive and we're in a defensive state constantly and don't even realize it. And we, got on, we go on autopilot, right? And so we have learned how to keep someone else happy, sure. how to give something to someone else because we're fearful. We're fearful to stand for ourselves. We might lose something, that attachment to that person, that approval from that person, whatever that is. So we have learned to just say yes. Yeah. And then we're miserable. I'm terrible so, at this. Yeah. Right, I heard you talking about this earlier, like you don't want to disappoint people. We take on more than our responsibility and we lose ourselves. So whole yes is checking in, we call it integrity to self, using our our emotional intelligence, our body intelligence, and then our IQ. What is my whole yes about this? And will I listen to that? Not just going to figure out in my head and listening to that. And so also noticing when we're fearful to say something because someone might be responding to that, then we like water it down or we don't say the whole truth. So whole yes is just staying in our lane. There's three lanes in my world, my lane, your lane, and God's or the universe's lane. We tend to play in everyone else's lane and our job is to stay in our full lane ourselves. Really like that. Yeah. Do you find, do you, and this is, you coach a lot of people, do you find that that idea of being conscious of yourself and being self-aware is sometimes learned way too late in life because you said, you know, it starts in schooling almost. And I feel myself, I became self-aware probably in my mid twenties. I was out of law school already. Mm -hmm. By the time I was truly able to be honest about my, my self-awareness, my strengths, my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I feel like nobody teaches you that early on. It's almost like you, like you said, you're in a path and you just kind of go through that path, but you never Mm -hmm. work on learning what you yourself want. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'm, I'm really excited because I, um, I work here in Chicago and I also am working in Nashville. I'm bringing this work there and I mentor at the Entrepreneur Center in Nashville. And what I find there is that there are a lot of young people from Vanderbilt, Belmont, universities there that are in entrepreneurship. And I find that they are waking up earlier to themselves, thank God. I don't know how that is, but I, the 20 year olds are way far above where I ever was or way far above some of the 50, 60-year-olds that I coach. So um, 
I think, I don't know if it's social media that people are finding suffering, because suffering is a choice, Sure. right? And we see suffering more and more and more than ever, and we see it all the time. So I don't know if they're waking up to that faster than we did, because it's all around them, and they're like, I don't want that. Right. Right. And on the other hand, we see more suicides because of it. And that's something I want to start standing for is I want to actually build a school, schools that teach just this genius, not just shoulds and have tos. Right. So, yeah, I want to raise that up. And I would love people to support me in that. I want to stop. I want to be one that helps stop suicide. And I believe that's where we're going now. This is what's what it's created, that kids think they have to do this, and they're seeing it on here on the right. Right, on social media, and they're not living up to it out there. So what are we all going to do who are, have woken up to a different stage? How can we support them and wake up? So. You do so much. To, you hit on so many different parts of not just kind of a, a, a business and their culture, and how to be a leader, but really how to just be a more effective human being for yourself. Mm-hmm. Because if you are a more effective human being, you obviously will lead more effectively and you'll live a much more meaningful life. Mm-hmm. What kind of, um, I, I know you mentioned some events in some places you work. If somebody wants to come and get coaching or leadership from you, how do they do it? I know you guys have events coming up. Tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about how yeah. people get a hold of you and get, um, I guess, exposure to all the good things that you're, yeah, you're thank coaching. You. So SunderlandCoaching.com. Uh, my website, uh, feel free to call me anytime. Uh, getting a coaching experience um, is, is wonderful because it's an experiential thing sure. versus just a reading. Um, and then I'm offering a lot of events at my retreat center in Nashville. So people from all over the country are coming there to experience um, leadership that way as well. Do you have one? There's one coming up in July, correct? There is one coming. There's actually a uh, three-month session going on starting in July as well. And then in August, September, there will be uh, events right on in Nashville. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'm, well, I'm go- going to Nashville tomorrow morning. I, I'm excited to go. Yeah. So next time I come, hopefully it'll be come, coming down to see you and some of your events. I would love it. Come on down. Any tips in Nashville? Have as much fun as possible. <laughs> any any good barbecue spots? I don't eat meat. So. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> Although, if you're looking for vegetarian, Avo is an awesome place. So <laughs> I give them a plug. <laughs> we're probably going to skip that, but if we get tired of the barbecue, yeah, that, exactly. that's where we're probably going to... Lots of great music all the time right now going yeah. on in Nashville. So if you're into music, you're love going to music. the right place. I love yeah. country music, so I'm, yeah. I'm going right down to the right place. Yeah. One thing I do want to touch on um, before we do some roundtable is culture, because I want to go back to mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like... I use it as a value proposition when I'm trying to get somebody to come into our office. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, hey, you know, our culture is, uh, it's a lot of fun. We do every six weeks, we try to do an event to get everybody together just so that people collaborate and they spend a lot of time together Mm -hmm. and and it's just a good working environment. How, when you go in to do kind of a, uh, maybe it's a rehab or an overhaul or just a coaching on somebody's culture, what are the things that you look for to, to make a good culture, if, if that's a even yeah. definable term? Yeah, so I start to notice, um, is there a blame culture or is it a curiosity culture? Okay. Is it one where there's collaboration and communication? Is it a place that can be heard and said and accepted of everyone without judging? Can we just hear each other without filters? And could there be some truth that someone's telling me? Or is it, oh, it's their fault that this didn't happen, right? Usually, typically, it's that way, right? There's some kind of blame. And so, hey, no problem. That's how we've all grown up. That's how our brain is. So can we, do we have a leadership culture that's willing to look at how am I creating this culture? And will I be responsible for shifting it one person at a time? So that's what I look for is someone willing as a leader to own their place and be vulnerable about that and own this is I'm creating this culture and I'm part of that and am I willing to learn my my own self and am I willing to join bring up other empower people versus trying to control people sure and it, I, I think that and this is just from experience I think that is the one piece where if you just don't have that correct culture you're going to have a lot of people come to your office looking like they're sad to get on the train, looking like yeah. they're sad to drive in. And that just has such an exponential effect on everybody else. I, I, when I go into my office and if somebody is sad or upset or mad, or even when John and I are here and you know one of us has had a bad day or something, John and I do a very good job of 
bring each other's moods up somehow. You know, he's had bad days, I've had bad days, and we're just good at it. There's two of us, but we're, we also happen to be good friends now, and we work well together. But just one person in an office that yeah. just is unhappy yeah. can just really change the whole culture. Absolutely, it's an energy. It's an energy, you can feel it. You can, you, I'm sure you all have walked into a, a, an office you've never met anyone, and you mm -hmm. can sense it. Oh. Or you can sense joy. You can sense, you can sense creativity. You can sense sure. openness versus a defensive, close, go away kind of culture. It's why, yeah. it's why I stayed home the last couple of days. It was one of those things where I said, I am going to be just a miserable person to be around and nobody else needs to be, um, they, they don't need to be around it. I, I'm very seldomly the type of person that just takes a day off. Even when I, I had pneumonia, I took a day and then I was like, okay, with antibiotics, yeah. I can go back now. But, um, I just I was like my mood will bring everybody else's down. I just can't be that person. So do you want a little coaching right now? Yes, please. Okay. So my toss knowing is that you're male, right? No offense no, either or male or female. Taken. Um and our culture is that we don't allow our emotional intelligence to be there. We talk about what is emotional intelligence and that's most important even more than our IQ, but yet we don't know how to practice it. Yeah. So it is really just getting in touch with getting out of our head and just owning what's here for me now. And will I allow it to just come through? And would I be vulnerable with the people that I'm with, sure. even my team? Because the most amazing leaders are the ones that are vulnerable. Yes. And their people see them. And then they, that shows them it's okay for me to be vulnerable yeah. with what is coming up for me. Absolutely. And so just being in the space of, hey, guys, you know, I'm just feeling whatever it is yes, in this now moment. And I just want to share it with you. And it doesn't mean it's going to stay there. Our emotions only stay for a most of 90 seconds if we feel them all the way through. Okay. If we push them away and go to our head and think through it, you call it cognitive looping, it will stay in us. It's an energy and we will get sick. Interesting. So we want to ex allow it to come through us in vulnerability, commitment for us, for us is just speaking unarguably what's just true for me right now in this right. now moment. And how is that? And then notice how you might be taking on more than your responsibility. How are they going to be affected by you? You're getting in their lane. Right. So stay how do I lane. just stay in my lane and just share what's coming up for me? Right. Well, I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. The 15 Commitments to Conscious Leadership. Is that a book? It is a book. It's found book. on Amazon, um, it, in paper, and Audible. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, first, yes, Kelly, you had a life change. So how did you two meet? I'll let you tell the story of how you two kind of got in touch. One of my dear friends who is also cycling with Deborah and I in Charleston, she was a catalyst to get us together. She started coaching with Deborah and we went to dinner one night and she said, oh my gosh, I've met this incredible woman. She's spunky, she's smart. She's, I've hired her to help guide me through some major decisions I have coming up in the next year. And I said, oh, I think it's time for me to get a coach too. Can you send me her information? So that's how Deborah and I met. And um, instantly I knew, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, you know, I it's 15 years into the business almost, and I had not stopped enough to say, well, am I am I getting better? What can I do differently? And no one, if you're the leader, really challenge you challenges sure. you a lot. So I wanted that, and I wanted more accountability in my life and curiosity. And I'd never set a set of values to Ballas Group ever before I met Deborah, and she started my wheels turning. I thought, gosh, how great would it be to have a set of values three five that I make it known when someone comes to join the team or if we're having issues, um, we come right back to the values conversation instead of a personal conversation and it makes life so much easier um, to guide you and it just feels good. So it was about 15 years in when you decided to do that? So I'm about a decade in and we were talking off air where I feel like that is the missing link for me myself. I, I feel like I'm missing that. I, I haven't done that and I read a lot, but I think just having somebody who keeps you accountable and just gives you a roadmap. I mean, I learned a lot from both of you in the last 45 or so minutes, um, but I huge value, I'm sure, for you. Oh, it's huge. I and you had a life-changing experience, too? I did. I'll let uh, you two, tell actually. two of them. Actually, yes, two of them. So I love, I love what I do, and I always have, and I love traveling and seeing the world because we grew up pretty poor. And I, when I was 18, I went to college, got out, graduated without debt because I played college volleyball. I said, I'm going to go travel. And I got this bug. And I, I kind of, I, so I've seen 42 countries. Wow. I've, I still travel a lot for work, but I um, just got back from Greece on Saturday. I would say that um, the first life-changing experience was I met the man of my dreams late, 38. 
And I thought, this is why I waited so long. I was here in Chicago. And he said he wanted to have more kids. I said, well, I absolutely want to have kids. It's part of my plan. Um, so the first year went by and we talked about it. The second year went by. We talked about it, but I could tell he was having some trepidation. I was like, mm, this isn't good. So the third year we were supposed to get engaged, the truth came out. He just couldn't make that decision anymore. And I thought, oh, like talk about impeccable agreements, which is a chapter in the 15 um, Commitments of uh, Consciousness. That was not held. And so it, it hurt me so badly. I remember waking up angry at the world for a year and I changed the cells in my body like I know and there was a lot of stress too plus running a business and trying to grow it and I shut off the emotion I actually mm-hmm. put everything mm-hmm. into my business I had the best year ever at that point but it wasn't I wasn't fulfilled and um so I someone said why don't you try to have a baby on your own and I said I just didn't picture life like that so I decided I'd give it one shot um and the doctor said come back with a clear mammogram the next week I said see you in a week and then I didn't get that clear mammogram so the good news is we caught it early, but it was early stage breast cancer. And I think by wanting to be a little bold, it actually kind of saved my life. Um, wow. It was so unexpected. And I'm the, like, one of the healthiest people. My friends know they laugh at me. I do raw food. I do wheatgrass. I exercise six days out of the week, but it doesn't matter if stress. you're not if you're not managing stress the way you should and and the emotions and like Deborah just mentioned, letting them go through you. I shut everything down. I just poured it into work. So it was, you know, in hindsight, when I backed out of it, I was like, hmm, I now know why I got breast cancer. I can, I have a genetically identical twin. Thankfully, she has nothing. I tested negative for the BRCA. I mean, I brought this on. Yourself. So yeah, now I have skills and different techniques today to manage stress. Um, a lot of deep breathing, a lot of thinking, uh, martial arts. You know, I just, it's oh, different. Kind? I do Aikido. Oh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> John and I are both big martial arts fans. Oh, nice. Like karate for most of my life, jiu-jitsu nice. as well now. Yeah, it's more mental than physical, but people think it's physical. Uh, you know, you touched on something that I think is so important. You know, you have your physical health, which, you know, and people look at it like, yeah, I go to the gym, I work out, I, I do all these things, but there's that whole mental health. And I, I think people think of mental health as a negative term of art when it, it shouldn't be. You, you have to have that because that can be just as damaging if you're not protecting that. Yes. I mean, we all have cancer cells. It's a matter of what turns them on. And I, I turned mine on that year. I just, I, I vividly saw how, it, like in hindsight, I could see exactly how it happened. And so, um, you know, knock on wood, it's been five years, and um, but it makes you see the world differently. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And now you guys are doing a 50-mile race together. Hi, yeah. Did November. you get, uh, Deborah, did you get her into biking? Was that? No, she, kind of she, came, she came with bike. I came with, came with bike. bike. I did triathlons for yeah. 12 years before, okay. and I uh, took a break. And But honestly, I... I get on the bike and I ride. I like to ride. I know nothing about how to put that bike together, how to, you know, take care of it. So Deborah is going to teach me that. Well, I don't know about that. I just ride a bike too. Well, I, <laughs> I go fast. I get on and I go fast. <laughs> yeah. I'm a pretty, I race cars. I'm not very good at fixing cars, but I, I can, I know enough to take care of myself. I have no idea how uh, to put my bike together. So when I ship my bike out for the mm-hmm. triathlon, I used a tri-bike transport company that just takes your bike. Yeah. And I got there, and the, they give you your pedals. And I looked at the guy and go, can you just put my pedals on for me? I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And I was like, what happens if I get a flat? I have no mm-hmm. idea what to do. And they're like, there'll be a guy on a motorcycle that comes around and fixes your flat. And I'm like, yeah. okay, that's yeah. good. Very nice. You just put everything together that's great. and you just well, let so what, what cars do you race? Uh, now Porsches, but I've raced go-karts when I was a kid. I drove some open-wheel stuff, BMWs, but now I Mostly Porsches. I love the sound of a Porsche. I can hear yeah. them with my eyes closed on the street yeah. walking my dog. <laughs> they're just they're my favorites, and I've raced them for a long time. But later in the season, there might be might be driving something else, even a Honda. So we'll see. Oh, wow. So that's my favorite car. Really? Okay. Yes. And I Mine too. since I was a freshman in college, I said I'm going to be a race car driver, and somehow I caught the poor man's Porsche. I have a Mini that I drive around. Awesome. But I think that's what got me into racing. I'm just love to go fast as well too. Have you ever taken it out on the racetrack? No. Well, we're going to have to change that. I would love that. There is a uh, country club slash racetrack called the Audubon Country Club in Joliet, and they have days where uh, different schools. I've raced my bike on that. You have? Yeah. Your bicycle? (laughs) Um, there's there is, an event there's a yeah there's a critique uh criterium there mm-hmm. really okay well <laughs> we will have to take you in your car there because i yes. have instructed racing schools for 
a good part of 15, 16 years now. Awesome. So I we'll have to take it. you out there. Can my boat fit there? Can a boat? I don't, I don't own a boat. Well, they I fly, heli- there's, I don't think there's any water there, but they fly helicopters there. Now, we had a guy uh, on the show who does the Chicago helicopter tours, and they actually take people from Chicago to there and land a helicopter. Oh. And then the people get out, they race their car. Because the people who are actually members of that country club, I'm not. They have cars and garages, and they take helicopters there, land, go drive cars, and take helicopters back. Very fancy. Yes. Very, very fancy. Well, I'm going to let John ask some questions, if he's got any, because I know we have a hard stop at four. Even though I feel like I could go, we have to have them both back on again, because I feel like I could do this for another two, three hours for sure. After our 50 miler. Yeah. (laughs) I'll cheer you guys on. I'll tell you, the toughest part for me was the hills and the bikes in San Francisco. I thought it was going to be the swim, but... Yeah. The, the hills were the worst. You're brave getting in with the sharks. You are. It's just cold water out there. Yeah. The water didn't feel that cold, honestly. It was more the um, the chaos at the beginning, I think, that was crazy. I was kicked. I was hit a lot, but I adjusted to that. <laughs> and I saw a sea lion behind me two days prior when I was training. Wow. And I was knew sharks are in there, but I didn't think sharks were going to come around. But the sea lion was 50 yards behind me, and its head was like that. Yeah, but sharks chase lions. So yeah, they do. And seals. Did, did his head stay behind you, or was he missing? Well, he was. I told a guy. I said, uh, if he gets any closer, can you get between us? Because he's fast, I'm slow. But he was making a lot of commotion. Because I looked back and I just saw water um, spraying, and I didn't know what he was doing because I was level with the water. When I got in the little dinghy he had, he said uh, it was smashing a striped bass or something on the water because I saw birds uh, flying over it. Yeah, and. It was trying to eat the yeah. bass. So I was preoccupied with that, thankfully. And then sushi. He actually, yeah, sushi. He actually <laughs> pulled me on the boat because there was a seal had jumped off. What he did was he took me to the Golden Gate Bridge, and I thought he was joking with me because I was told him I was terrified of open water. I don't have any open water mm-hmm. experience. And he said, "Okay, we're going to jump out here and we're going to swim to Alcatraz because the flood is going that way." And I'm looking at Alcatraz, and it's a couple miles that way. And I laughed. I said, "Okay, <laughs> funny." He said, "No, I'm serious." I said, okay, where do I get back in? He goes, at Alcatraz. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, we're jumping in here. And literally the Golden Gate Bridge is above me. So I figured, okay, he's not going to let me die. So I jumped in and started swimming. But right when we got to Alcatraz, they just sit up on the rocks, the seals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he said one had jumped in and was swimming at me. So actually when he shouted at me to get in was because he, he's like, seals typically don't come after humans, but he was coming towards you. So he's like, I pulled you in. I said, okay. Good. Thanks, said, man. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the seal looked... Because when I got in, I saw him. It looked the size of me. The sea lion was big. Yeah. Uh, even at 50 yards away, its head was huge. Is that the one with the tusks? Or that's the walrus? No walrus. But sea lions have, they're 300 pounds. The seal is like my size. So the seal <laughs> didn't scare pounds. me as much. The <laughs> sea lion, that freaked me out. So you guys are both brave. Triathlons and all, all the biking that you do. And I got to commend you for getting back on the bike. It's... Yeah. Um, that is a very big accident. I've seen people get in uh, auto racing accidents and just yeah. say, that's it. I'm done. I had a friend of mine who was a very good professional race car driver, got in a very bad uh, car accident at Road America, got airlifted. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was him or his wife or yeah. a combination of both that just said, that that's about it for us. Yeah. Um, but I commend you. Eight months later, you said you got back on the bike. Yeah, I realized that, that um, it's my love and I didn't want fear to drive me. Yeah. I wanted my love to drive me. That's fantastic. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, I'm going to ask them both for advice. Yes. Do you want me to ask that? Yeah, that's what I was, okay. that's where I was where gonna gonna go. That's where you're going to go with. Because I know we've got uh, Five about minutes left. three minutes. Okay. Um, Kelly, I'll start with you. Um, we always ask on the show if it could be for an entrepreneur, a business owner, or just any life advice in general. Um, any advice for anybody maybe starting a business or who's a business owner? Yes, I when I when the year I started Ballast Group, Steve Jobs gave the commencement speech at Stanford, and the title was Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish. And I never forgot that, because I, you know, as a kid I was really scrappy and hungry, um, but I always remembered you can't forget to laugh at yourself, and you mm-hmm. can't, can't be afraid mm-hmm. to make mistakes and look foolish, because if you don't try, you know, you'll never get to the next level. I always try to put myself in like one or two notches of, ahead of where I think I am, Um, because that's where I'm going to learn and grow. So uh, stay hungry, stay foolish, and I would say be bold and be authentic to Deborah's message too. Know who you are. You know who you are. Mm -hmm. Just have to be, Mm -hmm. give yourself permission to to live it every day. Great advice. Love that. Deborah. Hmm. Just to come back within. Be with yourself. Be still. 
listen to yourself, trust yourself, create what you most want and believe you can create whatever you want. You truly can. It's what you believe. I love it. It's uh, so much self-awareness. And I, I can see why the two of you have become very close friends. And obviously, I'm sure you both learn a lot from one another. I've learned a lot from you guys this last hour. And uh, again, I, I wish we had a cutoff time of six o'clock because I think mm-hmm. I could keep going on and on and on. <laughs> come racing. A lot from both we'll of you. Uh, I don't know if I can do 50 miles. <laughs> I'll come boat racing. I don't know how handy I would be because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think <laughs> I can be bike 50. Yeah, be ballast. I'd be ballast. Just set me up front. <laughs> rail meat. The other term of it's called rail meat. Rail meat? Okay, rail meat it is. Um, I don't, I'd rather be rail meat than bike 50 miles, I think, after uh, after <laughs> last week. So Thanks for having I'll us. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming on. John, uh, what's going on for next week? Uh, so it's our quarterly. Oh, that's right. Ask us almost anything. Uh, Please, almost anything. Just, yeah, where we just get to interact with the people that watch uh, the show and things they might want to know about you or me, uh, business or personal, just throw some stuff at us and we'll be here at three o'clock. Uh, it's a little more casual and just kind of hang out, talk back and forth and field some questions. You mean you're not going to have a vest and tie on next week? I'm not. Well, I might. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Yeah, guys, but. please uh, please ask us any questions. You can do it in advance, too. Yeah. Last time was a lot of fun. We do it once a quarter where John and I do kind of an Ask Mo and John anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, to some of my friends, you can't ask us literally anything. You can ask us <laughs> within reason anything and we'll answer. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. So awesome. that's, uh, that's going to be it for this week so that you can get out on the water. Yeah, good luck. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Kick butt. Thank you. And is Hopefully you're the lead boat and everybody else has to follow you. The boat's no problem. <laughs> boat's name is No Problem. No Problem? Oh. No Problem. Oh, you're going nice. to win. No Problem. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Uh, you got anything else, sir? No. I'll see you guys right. next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Three, two, one.